right, there's actually three short stories. Um, and the first one starts probably back in the mid 80s when USA Swimming moved to Colorado Springs. At the time, we were interested in understanding the relationship between elite performance and the age of the athletes actually competing at that level. So I made a trip to Colorado Springs and I said, we're trying to find data on all the prior national championships as far back as we can go. And so one of the USA Swimming staff persons took me to a room and opened a drawer and said, here it is. And it was just loose leaf psych sheets from prior nationals. So we've come a long way. So that's the first story. The second story is that uh, I got a call probably somewhere between 1999 and 2000 asking me what I would think about the fact that USA Swimming would start building a performance database. And I said, well, what are you going to do with the data? Because as a mentor of many, many grad students, if they don't have a reason for collecting the data, I don't let them collect the data. And USA Swimming at the time said, well, we don't really know what we'll do with the data, but it might be useful down the road. Anyway, I said, well, that seems like a pretty big waste of time and money, but your decision. So are you familiar with the fact that USA Swimming has a database? I don't know whether you know that. Does everybody know this? You don't know this. OK. Well, needless to say, I had uh, many students over the years um, carrying on a tradition from my wife to tell me that I'm wrong. And it turns out that we have spent now quite a bit of time over the last five, six years focusing on this database. The next part of the story is we went out to uh, North Baltimore, which again, everybody is aware, develops a lot of elite swimmers in the United States, all right? And we spent a lot of time filming their athletes. We were, the big question was, was the skill levels and the competencies required to execute backstroke starts, for, forward starts off the block, et cetera, in terms of a safety perspective. And we were invited to go to North Baltimore because they had 800 swimmers currently training, and they had another 300 on a waiting list. So spending a week or so out there would give us the opportunity to get a lot of swimmers on film. Well, when we weren't filming, we were watching practices and talking to coaches and the athletes. And our conclusion was that swimmers were swimmers. They didn't look different from the swimmers that we were engaged with. The training philosophy was similar, the reps, sets, everything looked familiar. But our club was not generating Olympians and theirs was. So what was the big difference? And that led us to this graph, which I'm hoping that all of you at some point in time in your life has seen. And I thought at one point in time in developing this talk that maybe that would be the only slide that I would use. All right, and basically what it is is re commonly referred to as the normal distribution. Basically, if you have enough data and you present it graphically, this is what it should look like, assuming there aren't any inherent biases in the data. So, the point being, in terms of high-level performance, what's the goal? Well, it's to prepare athletes for high levels of competition, recruit, train, identify, refine, et cetera, et cetera. And by definition, in our world, in particular, we're talking about world championships, we're looking for outliers, right? We're looking for the people who are performing at the very highest level. Okay, I, I uh, live in Bloomington, Indiana. Depending upon the census and how they count numbers, somewhere between 50, 60, and 100,000 people. If they want to count the students, that's 100,000. If they don't count the students, it's 60,000. But we have about anywhere from 100 to 200 swimmers, depending upon the season. Again, North Baltimore has somewhere, now that's just North Baltimore. That's not the only aquatic club. They believe they draw from a population of somewhere between seven and nine million. I draw from about 60,000 
they draw from nine million. All right, so the question is, what is the implication or are there implications of having two, three, four, five, ten times the number of swimmers? And the last thing down there, it says the distribution of traits within the human genome that favor performance. So as I sit and listen, I realize how complicated performance is, and anybody that's coached also realizes that. I'm a physiologist. I don't know anything about this part. <laughs> that's all. That just doesn't make any sense to me. So, Okay. Again, some of you may uh, be familiar with uh, the book entitled Outliers, and uh, this is obviously um, debated in the athletic circles. Uh, one of the theories has to do with 10,000 hours of deliberate practice and whether or not you believe in talent. So how many people here believe in the thing called talent? The majority does not appear to. So how many think it's all about practice and training? No, not too many. All right, so it looks to me that talent wins. In this group, talent wins. So again, there's our uh, uh, standard distribution, right, empirical rule that we started with. So what's it take to be considered an outlier? Well, these are the numbers, all right? Um, what I've done here is I've normalized this for standard deviations. You're going to see several different variations of this. But most people believe to be considered elite, you have to be within the top 1% of all performers. Some people are more conservative and say, well, no, you have to be within the top half of 1%. All right? In order to do so, the odds of being in the top 1%, you can see two standard deviations, one in 44. Beyond three standard deviations, it's one in 741. And to be, whoops, it just disappeared. There it is. Uh, beyond four standard deviations, which is where an athlete needs to be to be considered elite, it's one in 30,000, 31,000, no, 32,000 people. All right? So probability is small. If what? If you're dealing with 100 swimmers. Right? So, the other way to state that, and again, it takes out and makes a lot of assumptions, but unless you have more than 30,000 competitors in your pool, the probability that an elite performer in the top half a percent of all those in the sport is, an, is essentially zero. So, what does that mean? It means you're going to have a lot of swimmers. I gave a talk recently in, a, in another country, and they said they wanted to know the real secret be between United States swimming. And I said, well, how many athletes do you have? And they said, well, well, in our country, we have between 1,500 and 2,000 swimmers. And I said, I live in Indiana, and we have 17,000 registered swimmers in Indiana. 17,000, right? If you talk to the pool manufacturers or the swimsuits or the goggle people, they say the market in the United States is roughly between one and a half and two million competitive swimmers. All right, so this doesn't give any credit to all the paradigms we've recently talked about in terms of coaching education, coaching competency. I admit that, all right? doesn't give any credit to the leadership, the organization, the administration, any of that stuff. This is just the numbers, right? Okay, so we've been through this. So what happens to this curve when you multiply the number of swimmers by 10? And you can see I've done this a group A and group B. Well, there's a mathematical construct and you can calculate it out and basically what it says is the performance that is the farthest from the mode or farthest out from the tail is a function of the n within that sample, pure and simple. Now, it turns out that until we started looking at this phenomena, if you think about it, there is no database that, can, that contains the very worst to the very top performance, right? Most of our competitions, there's some cutoff, right, 
you think about it, it's like there's always a cutoff that says, oh, we don't want to hear about all of these people. We just want these people, right? So it turns out the only database that we could find that was similar to what USA Swimming now has was in chess because chess keeps a ranking system. And so every time you play a chess match, it goes on the book someplace, all right? Well, again, it sounds to me or looks to me as if most of you are not aware that USA Swimming went ahead with their database. And our numbers now suggest that we have more than 100 million performances in that database. Right? And it's not just performance that's in the database, but we know where the performance took place, we know what pool it took place in, we know what date it took on, we know every, every splash from every athlete over the course of every year by sex, age, and region. All right? So, one of the things we did is we realized that we could use uh, computer-generated help, if you will, to to randomly select numbers or take numbers out of the database and see what effect that had on the extremes in performance. And it basically just confirmed what we had said before. This is for one event, and you can see that there's a relationship there. Uh, basically, it says that for all the performances within the database, it ranges between a correlation of 0.4 to point, and this is an R squared, to 0.4 and 0.65. So that, again, on the one end, 65% of the performances are a function of how many competitors were in that particular event. And that, again, to the coaching world, that should be a little scary. I'm basically dissing you guys and say, oh, all you need to do is get more kids in the pool, right? And the rest of it's going to take care of itself, all right? So... The fastest way to get fast, now again, at the regional level, we can do this. We can actually look within the United States database and we can look within any given region and say, how are they performing relative to the entire pool? Or we can say, where are their pockets of excellence where they are performing better? Or where are they performing worse than? And what's going on within that region? We actually tried to do this on an international level, but we couldn't find a database that was complete. All right, so are there other implications to this? And I just went through this. We can start to ask why or why not, right? Why are certain areas successful? And or, for example, we could say, is Baltimore actually more successful or is it just a function that they have 10 times or, or, or 100 times more swimmers? So first conclusion is the numbers matter. Now, I may not be talking to the coaches because the problem is, as we saw before, it's like the quality of coaching is in some regards related to how many kids you have in front of you. You can't coach 30,000 kids, right? So you have to increase your resources. The other thing it says at the national level or regional level is if you have uh, resources, and when I talk about resources, I mean money, it's like you have to, nobody has too much money. So you're always trying to make decisions about how should I spend this money, right? At a certain age, the money is best spent in recruiting young athletes, right? That is really the bottom line. We can go back to the uh, graph, and I think I will, but, but other questions that you can answer uh, from this database. And we have, we've been plowing through this, and you can imagine when somebody hands you 100 million data points, it's a bit overwhelming. It's, it's a lot overwhelming, all right? But you can do things such as we can track all the nine-year-olds and see what happens to them. Or we can compare 10-year-old girls and 10-year-old boys, and we can look at rates of progression, and we can take, let's take the top 100 nine-year-olds and see, are they still the top 100 when they get to be age 19? Now that study was done at one point in time and it was done backwards if you will I went to 19 year olds and followed them backwards and they said look only 5% of those kids were top 100 when they were 9 well the problem was they only looked at one event if we start at 9 year olds and go this way more than 40% of the top 100's kids are still in the sport 
and they're still in the top 100, which is a completely different conclusion. So these are things that you can do with a database. Now there are physiological consequences to this as well, which is sort of my domain uh, beyond just people numbers. But it turns out we can't go very far on that uh, because we don't have a complete database for virtually anything. So if you wanted to ask the question, you know, we always see average height. Well, in order to answer what's the average height, you have to have a complete data set for height. It's like, well, for what group do you want to know the average height? And we aren't really particularly interested in that, although in swimming, actually it is a correlate to performance. Um, but we don't have access to that. So my recommendation to governing bodies, in addition to performances, let's start adding some other variables that would be very easy to collect. Okay, so my mentor many years ago was Doc Councilman. And most people know who Doc Councilman was. He was a swimming coach, uh, 76 and I think 60. Um, treat all athletes as equal, but train all athletes as individuals. Um, that's not easy, right? Because we have to consider the nature of the stimulus on one hand, what are you prescribing? And then you have to recognize that every athlete is different and they have different limiting factors and they respond to the stimulus differently. So, yes, there are a thousand traits conveying or contributing to success in swimming. I don't know most of them. I know very few, all right? And it turns out we don't have the distribution. We don't know how the population, and you don't have the wherewithal necessarily to understand that or measure that. But one thing that I'm personally interested in and concerned about has to do with, and we don't need to look at this, you as a coach being clear about what the outcome of the stimulus is and the nature of that stimulus. So as you see in the second one says, are you training your athletes to survive multiple daily two hour practices or are you training your athletes to swim 100 fly faster? Or are you training your athletes to recover faster or are you just making them mentally tough? When I was a swimmer, one of the sets I was forced, asked, 100 100s on 130. I'm, a, I'm in the pool and out of the pool in about 15 minutes. Coach, why are we doing this? Make you mentally tough. It's like, Coach, I'm pretty mentally tough. I've been here since 5 o'clock in the morning. I don't need to do this. Anyway, I don't know what the goal was there. <laughs> and I'm still mad about it 50 years later. <laughs> All right. And that thing's not moving. Okay. So. Within the range of human variability, the one, again, that concerns the physiology is muscle fiber type. There's no doubt that muscle fiber type is a continuum and it's most likely inherited and it's still debated as whether or not you can transform one fiber type to another. And we'll talk a little bit more of that. But the continuum goes from E, endurance on one side, to P, power on the other. All right? And there are, there are they vary and they reflect different functional capacities and people walk into your pool somewhere along that continuum. And again, early on, many years ago, the concern was these fiber types were set and were not transformable. What you see is what you get. More recently, the concern is, well, maybe they are transformable. If they are, I better be careful about what I do to my athlete, right? Okay, so we've seen this. There are many different fiber types that exist from endurance to power. Every given fiber sits somewhere between the slow and fast paradigm. That's the concern. And when I train the athlete, I shove it this way and I shove it that way. Now, I spent a week trying to find data on what is the normal distribution of fiber types of anybody, of the population. What I find in textbooks that says it's 50-50, but there's never a 
reference that cites where that 50-50 came from. So I don't know that I believe that. And if you think about it, that would be a hard number to come up with. How do you do 50,000 or 100,000 fiber typing? That probably doesn't exist. If you look at the papers, a lot of them are case studies, or they're an N of 6, or an N of 3, or an N of 2, and they are you know, an Olympic high jumper or A. If you look at swimmers, the dilemma is they reference them as swimmers. We took 16 swimmers. They wouldn't do that in track and field. They talk about sprinters or endurance, but in swimmers, they're just swimmers. So I don't even know what that means anymore in terms of swimmers. The other problem is there are many, many different paradigms for classifying fiber types in humans. They can classify it based on the enzyme characteristics of the cells or the mitochondria, or they can look at the contractile fractions of the fibers themselves. So it gets very confusing on that one. And one of the things I think is important for coaches to rec recognize that regardless of the fiber type, if I ask the question at what point along the continuum from no force to maximum force that I ask that fiber to contract against, where does peak power occur? Regardless of the fiber type, it's somewhere between 30 and 40% of max. So when I see what the coaches are doing, they say, well, how much weight will that thing get, carry? You know, if they have, they have a, a pulley system. Oh, we can put 200, put 200 pounds in. Or if I talk to the athletes, put 200 pounds in, all right? The point is that has a different effect. Or worse, we're gonna do, we're gonna do 50 of these and we're gonna do them in 50 meters each. It's like, well, again, be careful about what the stimulus is and what you ask your athletes to do. So there's a lot of physiology here, I'm running out of time. This is just a graphical representation of what I was talking about. And you can see on the one end, we've got endurance, the other end, force. Depending upon which fiber you're talking about, what you ask that fiber to do, you're gonna shove it one direction or the other, but they don't all have the same functional capacity. So if you do it with a type one, you get this response. This is a slow twitch. If you do it with a type two, which is a fast switch, you get something completely different. But the last thing in the world you want, you don't want your athletes at the mode or the medium, right? We're looking for outliers. So you gotta ask the question, am I training them for five hours of swimming a day? Or am I training them for 50 meter freestyle? So. The other thing is, and I've show you a couple slides there, if you, if you look at what's highlighted, it always says the tendency of the fiber is to go from fast to slow, regardless of what you do to it, right? Fast to slow, fast to slow. Slow to fast occurs as a result of decreased muscular activity or unloading, not the opposite, right? Fast to slow, right? Fast to slow, and you'll see this over and over and over. So, now, step back again, we're talking about big data. Are there ways of estimating power output and, and shortening velocity in swimmers? Yes, there are. We can do it in the pool. You've seen some of them today. Uh, Dr. G was talking about, and when you do it with 100,000 swimmers or whatever, you get lines that look like this. Some of these are not so good. The one on the bottom left doesn't look too bad. The one on the bottom right looks kind of like a scatter plot. The one on the top right, not so bad, and the top left is the best, but that's power measured in the water. And again, you've seen some of that already today. Power in the water, number one, doesn't take long to do it. It's easy, technologically simple. You get a graph like that, and once you have that graph, you can start looking at individuals, and I have two of them circled. They generate virtually the same amount of power, but one of them is appreciably slower, and that has to do with your domain and that's technique and streamline and resistance. The other thing that we've done with some of these numbers, and I'm, I'll, I'm, I'll, I'll be done. <laughs> some of the things that we see, we, 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 we see people talk about muscle strength, swimmers have to be strong, and you can see the numbers here. Um, strength is not a very good predictor of swim performance. It's like swim velocity and strength, not so great. Muscle size, the same thing. It doesn't do a particularly good job. Um, but when you start talking about swim power, now we got very high numbers. One of the best predictors of performance. And so you have to ask, what's the stimulus that creates that? 
and which fiber types am I stimulating? Okay, so in conclusion, if you haven't started building a database, you need to start to do so, right? You can use it for tracking athletes. You can do it for talent identification. You can, you can talk about progression and what, what swimmers should be doing or the mean does or the top 100 does. You can do program evaluation. You can identify sources of success. And then, don't stop there, build a system where they can start plugging in data, physiological parameters that we think are important in terms of success in the sport. Don't forget that graph. Maybe you should have that tattooed on my right shoulder, right? Thanks, Christina and Iska.